Hello, it is the Living Mandala podcast and the Living Mandala of the Planet series continues. This week we've got Uranus on tap. I want to give a little disclaimer here at the top of the episode that once again, we're in the coffee shop. You might hear some noises. It is what it is. Um, We did our best. And um, at one point in the episode, I believe I say Saturn and I meant to say Uranus. Anyway, forgive me. Uh, Maybe we didn't have enough caffeine yet or something. Anyway, enjoy the latest and greatest episode. Be sure to stick around after the bell, though, because I will be uh, tuning in to where I think Uranus shows up in the house and home, uh, the ways you can look for that within your living environment. Thanks so much for listening. You're listening to the Living Mandala Podcast. My name is Ara. Okay, and the Living Mandala of the Planets podcast series continues. I'm here with Rachel Ruth Tate, and we are going to talk about Uranus, or Uranus, if you're an eight-year-old boy. (laughs) (laughs) So Uranus is a really interesting planet. It's uh, not really visible by the naked eye. Um, It was discovered, quote-unquote, by telescope by Sir William Herschel, 1781, um, it's a really interesting story, um, you know, his discovery, uh, you know, Rachel, jump in, you know, correct me if, if I get any of these facts wrong, but essentially he discovered it and he, he wanted to name it after his king. Um, and so, you know, the planet was called George for a while, like, like as in King George. And the astronomers in the world sort of said, no, 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 <laughs> we can't call this new planet George. Um, and so it took a while, but eventually they landed on Uranus. Um, and so here we are with Uranus all these years later, but the glyph for Uranus still looks like an H for Herschel because that was sort of the other name. It was sort of like Herschel's planet. So the glyph, you know, kind of had an H look to it. I learned all this from our shared astrology teacher, Austin Kopic. He, he teaches a great class on Uranus. And, uh, and, it, and he has a very engaging way of talking about it. And that's why it's stuck in my head. Um, but just such a fascinating story that, you know, it's very discovery. And you'll learn, you know, Uranus is all about disruption. But, you know, it's very discovery was a whole disruptive thing. Well, and it, the English like to colonize pretty much everything and call it there. <laughs> Even distant planets. Because Uranus is presence, the presence of some large planet beyond Saturn was theorized by so many astrologers and astronomers right. over so many thousands of years, they simply lacked the technology to be able to physically see it. And so as soon as we got it, this is ours. We discovered it. Well, is kind of, it? kind of, Ur- sort of. Uranus is disruptive in that exact way, though. Right. And as we talk about Uranus, the wind is picking up here totally appropriate of course and you know and uranus you know it makes sense in terms of the naming convention past jupiter and saturn um you know uranus uh saturn's the father of jupiter right and then uranus is the father of saturn which i think a lot of people don't don't know that so so oranos the god of the sky met with gaia the matter of the earth and they were in love and they united. But Oranos, the sky, would not create space for Gaia to release the byproducts, the children of their union, until Cronus, Saturn, Saturn, took his scythe, rings, and castrated his father. <laughs> God! Causing him to back up. And that is how we have the heavens sort of... Uh, the atmosphere between the heavens and the earth, that is the space created for life. Wow. Yeah, well said. And so, you know, talk to us about, you know, how Saturn shows up in an astrological chart. So Uranus is a planet that hasn't been a part of Hellenistic astrology simply because we couldn't right. see it. And so thus we could not express it um, in those earlier, most foundational astrological practices. Some people consider Uranus to be a part of modern astrology exclusively. As a Hellenistic astrologer, though, and having practiced on thousands of charts, I have to use Uranus. I have to use Uranus. And I love how it's getting more cacophonous. It is. is. The coffee shop music is playing. People are talking. Right, right. But that is very Uranian. So 
in the chart, Uranus expresses as the place in one's life where there is constant innovation, mm. where there is potentially disruption in the space of life, depending on the house. Mm. And the sign that Uranus is in, it expresses the nature of that change. Because Uranus, it is proof that change is constant, right? We've always known that the only constant is change. Time marches on. But the flavor of that change is different in the nativity of each person. And Uranus, it takes 84-ish years right. to go around the zodiac. So we get to experience, hopefully, one Uranus return. And I often find that people approaching the end of their lives with this awareness, if you're in your mid-80s, right, that maybe there is something that you become enervated, energized to do that you hadn't done before in your life. And that might be part of the purpose of you coming in. We are all supposed to disrupt outmoded patterns, right? We are supposed to, as beings, improve upon the past paradigms present in our society. And Uranus is the way in which we do that. Now, all of the other planets we've talked about, they have signs which they rule. We're going to talk about Uranus now, then Neptune, then Pluto. They do not have signs that they rule. Obviously, they weren't a part of the, the Greek mythology because they weren't present. <laughs> or we couldn't see them. We couldn't see them. So they weren't part of the conversation. But modern astrology gives rulership of Aquarius to Uranus. Now, in my own practice, I don't think that's right. I do think, however, that there is a simpatico between Uranus and Aquarius. And I will even say, I would venture to say that Uranus is... That, that uh, affinity it has for Aquarius, it's almost like exaltation. Mm. Where when Uranus is in Aquarius, it disrupts in just the very way that helps to expand and to create invention within society. Because all of the major changes, like technological innovations, those are very Uranian. And we're living in this highly, highly Uranian time as technology is exponentially increasing, especially its role in each of our lives. And I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Uranus is actually about to enter the sign of Gemini here very soon. And maybe when some people are listening to this in a year from now or two years from now, Uranus will be in Gemini. Right. And that is the place where it was during a lot of very important times. It's the natal Uranus placement for the United States, the Civil War was fought, right? The Revolutionary War was fought underneath Uranus and Aquarius. So sometimes things need to change. And Uranus is very good at breaking up a, uh, an established party. Wow. Yeah, I, I, Uranus is in Taurus right now. And then that's got its own flavor, literally. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, but, but, but it is, it is a little bit, um, it's a nail biter to think about Uranus back in Gemini, uh, the very ungrounded air sign. <laughs> it's like one extreme to another is how it feels to me. Disruptions in polarity is what I'm expecting, but hey, Woo. disruptions in the economy, the food supply, all those sorts of things, Uranus and Taurus, I can let those go by. Those will be find a leaf. Right. Right. So, yeah, Uranus um, is associated with the third eye. Um, you know, again, you know, like you were just saying, you know, the, Uranus wasn't in the conversation thousands of years ago. So, you know, early chakra conversations, no one was talking about the third eye. The traditional third eye is the sun and the moon combined. But um, there are some modern um, interpretations uh, linking it to intuition, innovation, higher mental faculties. Um, and so... You know, I just leave that there. It's not a, a real association in the very traditional sense, but it is sort of like it's the modern ruler of Aquarius. The modern association, I would say, would be the Ajna chakra. Um, in terms of alchemy uh, and the metals, um, you know, Uranus wasn't in the conversation when these you know, the original chart of correspondences were sort of being created. But I will point out that there is uranium, <laughs> namesake. So uh, discovered in 1789, just a few years after the planet was discovered, which is interesting. So there was 
you know, a, a, a suspected reality of Uranus before Uranus's discovery, well, in the periodic chart of elements, there was a placeholder for something who knows what it would be that, you know, in all of the radioactive elements you, at those bottom two rows in particular on the periodic chart. Um, so uranium is a very unstable, uh, it's found in pitch blend, um, that, that's a stable form of it out in the wild, but, uh, but, but isolated by itself, um, it decays very quickly. So, um, you know, there is a metal in that sense. It's very clearly on the periodic chart and, you know, it seemed right at the, I guess at the time to name it uranium. Well, and think about how disruptive uranium was as a metal Truly. when we harnessed it. And I'll even say that uranium in small amounts is present in coal. And so coal mines themselves are incredibly radioactive. Think about how disruptive it was for humanity to be able to burn coal. It changed our whole deal even before Uranus was itself discovered. And then after uranium, Uranus were discovered, we used uranium to change the world. Right. Right. In some very potentially difficult ways, who can say if nuclear war is a positive or a negative development? But it was a big change. Big change. Um, in terms of a day of the week, there isn't a day of the week, so we're going to keep moving. Uh, in terms of the runes, the one that, that I think most uh, is associated with Uranus is uh, Hagalaz. I've also seen it Halgaz. Um, and it's basically like hail <laughs> is what it is. Um, and so it's very disruptive. Um, and so for those reasons, I, I choose that one. Um, in terms of the tarot, you know, uh, there isn't a traditional association. And, you know, maybe I oh, there goes the wind. Um, maybe there's I've got a friend or a listener that could clue me in at a future date about what a, a you know in the minor arcana of what would be the right correspondence in a tarot deck. I'm sure there are several that would fit. Probably within each sign, there's easily something that would fit. Um, but at the time of this podcast recording, I don't have it. Um, so I'll just leave that there. I sometimes put the Three of Swords there. Like exactly. The swords. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Exactly. So tell us why Three of Swords. Well, that implies change. Because oftentimes change is either forced or chosen. More often forced than chosen. And so when your heart is literally split apart, when it breaks, Ooh. you are made different. And you are changed. And often our hearts are broken, not necessarily physically. It's very rare that the heart, I mean, heart attacks, yes, but... When our hearts are, are broken, it's often information that we're getting that changes our emotional composition. And I think the Three of Swords represents that. Well, in the sword suit in general, references the air element, of which Aquarius is one of the air signs. And I think Uranus, the air, the communication, the sharing of technology is in and of itself a Uranian thing. Cool. That makes a ton of sense. So tell us about a yoga post. So I'm going to go with Sasangasana rabbit pose. I love that pose. It feels so good. I did it yesterday without even thinking about the fact that we'd be recording this today. So um, rabbit pose. Think about a close leg child's pose. So when you are kneeling and the, the forehead is on the ground, the legs are closed, the hips are sitting back against the heels. And then imagine the hands grabbing the heels and then lifting the hips so that the top of the head is on the earth it is very unusual to be upside down and to me the upside downness is in and of itself uranian but headstand is not something that is particularly accessible to myself or to a lot of other people this to me rabbit pose is one of the best ways to get that disorientation or to kind of get that perspective shift completely and yet be so stable right Aquarius is fixed air. You're so stable that you're able to gain that perspective and stay there in order to change the direction of the blood flow, right? And to redirect and to shift internally. And, you know, it's so cool that you chose that for those reasons, because one thing I failed to mention at the top of this episode is that Uranus actually rotates a 90 degree from its plane of axis. So it, it compared to all the other planets, it literally rotates sideways it rotates in a different direction um 
it's 90 degrees of what er, how everything else is rotating. So even just its presentation in the sky is on its head. <laughs> our inventors and innovators, our Uranian people here on the Earth, they look at things very differently than others. That's why the inventions that they make, you know, Edison, Tesla, nobody had done that before. If they had known about it, they would have done it because electricity is awesome. Electricity is kind of Uranian too. Cool. Um, I haven't been able to find in terms of like what that orbit looks like from the point of view of Earth. The, uh, the others I've seen examples of a geocentrically plotted orbit, like what orbit of the planet looks like from Earth. But since Uranus is so far, um, that doesn't exist. So unfortunately, I don't have a cool image uh, to show. And that'll be the same for Neptune and Pluto. Um, in terms of a suggested like takeaway way to connect with Uranus, um, I would just, I'm just going to leave this a very light touch. Uh, I'm not going to give a lot of um, instruction or, I, I mean, I have some authors that I really like. Um, I just ordered a book this morning uh, from Amazon, but I, just check out a book on chaos magic and just see what that's all about. Um, and that's, that's really all I need to say about that. Uh, the name applies it all. And it's very simpatico with um, Uranian energy. Um, I always think of Gordon White uh -huh. when I think of chaos magic. One, he is part of that movement, but two, his ideas are so revolutionary. And Revolution. Yes. <laughs> so that would be that would just be my suggestion on a on a meditation or a, just a way to seek out the the Uranus vibration. Check out a book on chaos magic. Just look up what that is. All right. Anything else to say about Uranus? No. I hope people take the outer planets. Uh, Take them more lightly in hand than yeah. the inner planets. Yeah. Their effect on the human life is harder to discern. Quite it's more literally. generational. Yes. More generational. More transpersonal. Right. I think Uranus is a wonderful planet to work with if you're looking to make change in your life and to disrupt some patterns. Amen. You're listening to the Living Mandala podcast. I'm <laughs> good. Hey there, it's me again. Thanks for sticking around after the bell. Hope you enjoyed this episode all about Uranus. Um, no, Uranus. <laughs> I knew my inner eight-year-old boy was going to rear its head. Uh, Uranus. So where does Uranus show up in the house and home? So Rachel and I talked about it at some point that, you know, it's, it's linked with electricity. And so, you know, what is your electrical situation like in your home? Do you have good lighting? Is it time to upgrade your lighting? Do you have extra bulbs? Is it time to, to, to switch out your bulbs and maybe get more energy efficient bulbs since Uranus is linked with uh, the electricity in your home? The other thing that Uranus is linked with is, you know, anything surprising, shocking, disruptive. So do you have a good quality first aid kit? Do you have what you need in terms of, you know, your go-to plumber or your go-to roofer or your go-to electrician? You can't sort of, predict when you're going to get terrible weather or when something disruptive is going to happen to the house and home, but you can certainly be prepared as best you can. Do you have a lockbox um, in case you have uh, to, you know, to lock up all of your important paperwork and you've got to get out of that house in a hurry? Do you have a lockbox? These are the types of things that come to mind when I think about Uranus and how it manifests in the house and home. So I hope you've enjoyed this series. Not sure what series is next. I'm in conversation with a couple of different folks um, to explore another arc, I guess, of correspondences um, and how they link back to the house and home. Either way, thanks so much for listening to the Living Mandala podcast. <laughs>